Well, hello and welcome to uh, our study of the New Testament. Uh, today we will continue in the uh, fourth chapter of the, of the book of Acts, uh, working through a uh, very interesting story. Uh, let's say a prayer and we'll, we'll get started. Our Father, we're thankful for the opportunities to study, and we're thankful for your word and where the things that it teaches us and brings us into our life and how it makes us more like your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Pray that you'll bless this study day and may it be fruitful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so our text will be uh, the fourth chapter uh, of the book of Acts, uh, beginning in about verse 32. When we look at the New Testament, we, we, we are often tempted uh, to think maybe somehow God has changed from the way He was in the Old Testament. We saw many examples of, of, God's, of God's wrath and His judgment uh, in, in, the old, uh, in the Old Law, the Old Testament. Uh, we saw stories like that of, uh, of Uzzah, uh, where he reached up and, and tried to steady the, uh, had to steady the, uh, the ark uh, and was stricken dead. We saw stories of, uh, of Nadab and Abihu who, who introduced strange fire and, and God immediately had fire consume them. We saw stories of, of Achan who, uh, who took what God had told them not to take when they were when the, the Israelites were sieging Jericho? J just so many stories of, of God's wrath, I guess you would say. And again, we start to think in the New Testament. Well, maybe that's maybe that's no longer present. Uh, but I want to before we jump into our text, I want to look at a particular passage uh, in the book of Malachi. Malachi being the last uh, the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, and this is God speaking uh, in, in Malachi, the third chapter, the sixth verse. And, and listen specifically what God says here, because I think it's very important. For I, the Lord, do not change. Uh, that is our God telling us that Old Testament, New Testament, old times, today, He's the same. And we get a reminder in this particular lesson today uh, of the, the penalty that, uh, that mankind will pay. Now, obviously the penalty that we pay today is more uh, associated with eternity. Uh, our, our eternal uh, domain, wherever that's going to be. Is it going to be uh, hell or heaven? Uh, but at this time in the early church, we get an example of God, uh, even in the church, uh, uh, executing his judgment in very swift and immediate fashion, and it's it's a striking story. The interesting thing about the story is it actually begins back in the fourth chapter, verse thirty-two, with that with that very positive image. But again, I, I want to make sure that we we're, we're we're understanding what's happening here. If you go back to the second chapter, uh, verses forty-three. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all as anyone would have need. I mean, we are, we are given here in Scripture the, the standard uh, for... Christian generosity. I mean, it it was it was as good as it, it had ever been, and it was ever, as good as it will ever be. Uh, where Christians were literally selling their possessions, selling their land, selling the things that they had, to make sure that other Christians uh, who were in need were cared for. Just an exceptional, extraordinary amount of generosity. That's kind of what we're picking back up here. Luke had kind of left that for a couple, pardon me, a couple of chapters, and is kind of picking back up with that with that same thought about what's going on. The thing I want us to notice and realize is this is not a commandment. This is not something that that the apostles were telling you should sell land and give it to the... You know, it's their land. They can do with it as they want. It's their possessions they can do with it as they want. It's the generosity that these, uh, that these Christians were feeling uh, through the example of some of their, of, their, of their own, and that's the first one we're going to see today, a very positive example. And then we're going to see a little bit on the other side uh, with, uh, with Ananias and Sapphira. So let's pick up in uh, verse 32. And the congregation of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, 
but all things were common property to them. I mean, that, that's kind of the mentality they get. And again, this is not by commandment. This is not by requirement. They could, they, could, they could keep what they had. When they sold what they had, they could keep the money or give it or give a portion of it. That's, it it's generosity that's being spoken of here. And that's the idea in verse 32, verse 33. And with great power, and the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the abundant grace that was all upon them. Again, uh, Luke has been very careful to to talk about the the gifts that the apostles had been given specifically back on uh, on the day of Pentecost, uh, where the uh, where the the, the the Spirit came upon uh, came upon them, and, and they had great power, and they had the ability to perform miracles, and etc. So, continue on in verse thirty four. For there was not a needy person among them. And the reason there was not a needy person among them is because these Christians were demonstrating such generosity by selling what they had. There was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales. Overwhelming generosity. And lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each who had need. Again, it wasn't... It wasn't like some kind of communal living where everybody put into a pool and then everybody would draw out of that. It was only for the needy. And, that, and again, we get that specifically from verse 35. And laid in the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as they had need. So, verse 36. Uh, we're introduced to a, a, an individual here who will, be, who will take a great role uh, later on in the, in the book of Acts uh, on the first uh, missionary journey with the Apostle Paul. But let's pick up, this is where we meet him, a man by the name of Barnabas. Verse 36, Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the Apostles, which translated, Son of Encouragement, who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the Apostles' feet. So, we, we kind of pick up with this discourse about Christian generosity, and then we have a specific example of, a, of an individual who had a piece of land. It didn't say it was all of his land. It just said it was a piece of land that he owned. He sold it and, and brought the entire proceeds and laid it at the feet of the, of the apostles. Very likely, in this same setting, uh, we're going to see a different side of that, where an individual is going to sell a piece of property, he and his wife, and rather than giving all, they're going to hold some back. And that would have been fine. And in my mind, that's almost like what we do today. I work at my job and I'm given a certain amount of money. I take a piece of that and I give it to the Lord. And the rest of that I keep for my family and for my, for my own needs. That's, there's nothing improper at all about that. And there would be nothing improper about a Christian selling a piece of property then and giving a portion. The problem became the deceit and to tempt the or test the spirit of God and God Himself. Uh, that's going to be the problem with this. With this you know, so we're kind of get, we kind of got the good side of generosity, and now we're going to get a little bit of deceitfulness uh, that, that that a Christian has introduced. And this is kind of the first. Certainly, probably, I wouldn't think it would be the first sin that was committed in the, in the early church, but it's the first sin that's that's recorded for us and. Uh, and it's recorded in such a fashion as to the extraordinary way which God dealt with this particular sin. Verse five, chapter five, verse one. Okay, but I mean, kind of clearly, clearly, uh, Luke is is same story, just a different side of just another side of the story. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. Again, it wasn't. There's nothing that said it was all their land. It just said it was a piece of property. And kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what is inferred here by what Peter is going to say is that they gave the the implication, or that they gave the 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 idea for the for the Christians there to believe that it was everything. And very likely, many commentators will, would say that this was kind of in the same setting that. Uh, that uh, that did Barnabas do his? So Barnabas very likely received some accolades and some uh, some appreciation because of his generosity. Uh, and this man uh, Ananias and his wife Sapphira wanted those same things, but they wanted to keep some of it, and, and that's where in the problem lies. But Peter said, verse three, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Uh, 
really putting the the blame where sin evolves from from Satan. Uh, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? I mean, again, I think it's important for us to appreciate it was not a requirement to to sell a piece of property or sell sell, sell a possession and give it all. Uh, you had that option. It was still their property. Uh, the deceit and the lying is is where we begin to see the, is where we begin to see the problem. Verse four, and Peter clarifies. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? In a, in a question. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? So, it, again, Ananias and Sapphira were, were under no obligation to give it all. Uh, but when they when they did, looking probably for glory and for accolades and for praise, that was where they that, that it became a problem with the Father and and the Spirit. After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Uh, that's that becomes the very essence of the of the sinful deed that Ananias had done, and and later we'll find that Sapphira was was in uh, was in agreement and and trying to do the same thing. Uh, verse verse five. As he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all of those who heard it. Uh, as one would expect to witness this kind of thing where, where a lie is given and there is an immediate answer from the Father about uh, the judgment of that lie is unusual and, and, and certainly not something that we continue to see throughout the New Testament. And after the days of the, the early church, we, we don't see these kinds of things anymore. It was not uncommon going back. But still, this is something that these Christians who witnessed it would, would likely not have forgotten. Uh, it, would be, it would be something that would be very traumatic uh, in, in the way that this thing transpired. Let's continue on and see what happens. The young men got up and covered him. We don't know with what. Very likely it was with his own tunic or, or their clothes, but in some way they, they, they covered him up. And after carrying him out, they buried him, which in that culture at that time for someone to die and to go be buried was not unusual. What was certainly unusual is that they didn't, uh, didn't tell the family. Now, many have speculated down through the years that that was by instruction of Peter uh, because they needed to determine if, if, uh, if his wife would also uh, try to uh, use this as a guise for, for glory and honor. Uh, but we don't really know that. Scripture's not clear. But for whatever reason, they just picked him up, took him out, out of town, and, and buried him. Hmm. Verse 7. Now there left an interval of about three hours, and his wife come in, not knowing what happened. So clearly no one had shared with her that uh, her wife, her, her husband, Ananias, had been stricken dead. So she is uh, kind of unaware of, of what's going on. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. And Peter said to her, verse 9, Why is it that you have agreed together, you and your husband, Ananias, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Uh, the Spirit is what gave Peter the ability to understand that she was lying. Uh, the Spirit is what is going to be demonstrating God's power here. Uh, and clearly, these, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, were testing the Spirit. We're, we're testing the Spirit with, with lies, with deceit, with uh, the, the idea that maybe we can get the same honor that this man Barnabas received by, by giving all when, when, when we didn't do that. So uh, Peter very, very clearly says that it wasn't... When he was talking to Ananias, when he was talking to Sapphira, it's not men you're lying to. Uh, you can lie to men and get away with it, but you can't lie to the Spirit and get away with it. That's, that's the idea. Behold, the middle of verse 9, Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. I, I must imagine for just a brief moment there that this woman, Sapphira, uh, felt the panic of her lie. Uh, as she had been caught and was was about to be about was about to be judged in a very dramatic fashion, uh, 
And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. So, wow, what a traumatic and what an, a dramatic uh, story that we have about, about events in the early church where, where we see something a little bit different than what we've kind of seen in all the other interactions with the apostles, where there were healings and where they were casting out of demons and where they were raising the dead and all these different things which are very positive. We, we suddenly get to see the other side of the story. And when we read that, my mind still must go back to the Malachi passage. For I am the Lord, I do not change. I mean, we still serve the same God who Israelites served thousands of years ago. He is the same then, He is the same now, and He will be the same forever. The judgment for our sins will be harsh and it will be eternal. Uh, and these are passages that help us appreciate and realize and not forget. Just because we think, oh, here we serve a God who loves us so much, as John 3.16 said, that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should have eternal life. That is absolutely true. We serve a God who loves us, who has sent His Son to die, to, to bridge the chasm of sin and, and bring us back into a relationship with Him. But just as surely as we can be saved, failure, deceit, lying, failing to do what God has asked will be met with judgment. That's the, that's the fearful side of, of, of what we know about our God. And, and this kind of passage just kind of helps reinforce that so that we are readily made aware. Uh, verse 11, And great fear came over the whole church. That's the first time the word church is used. It's referenced, uh, obviously, as, as we go back, but it's the first time we've used the, that uh, Luke recorded the word church. Uh, ecclesia is, is, the, is, the, is the, the, the term in their language that they used. It's used six or seven more times in the, in the, book, of, uh, in the book of Acts. And great fear came over the whole church and over all those who heard these things. You know, so it wasn't just those within the church who, who heard this story uh, of Ananias and Sapphira. It was kind of those on the outside. And it just, it just gave people an appreciation for the power that these apostles had, not just to heal, uh, but uh, to act with God, to act to carry out His, his judgment. Uh, very, very powerful story. Verse 12, it kind of, the story kind of changes again here and, and it comes back to more, a little bit more of a positive side. Verse 12, and, and at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. Now Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch, uh, is, a, is a place there in the entrance to the temple, one of the entrances to the temple. And much, much of what is happening is happening there at that particular location. Now, this event with Ananias and Sapphira likely was not at, at that particular location. Solomon's porch, Solomon's portico, as is, it's called in my version, is where a lot of the teachings and the miracles were taken. And that's because that's where the people were. All the people in Jerusalem were coming to the temple uh, each day to, to offer prayers, uh, certainly on the Sabbath. Uh, that's that's where the people were, and that's where you're going to to find the apostles. Uh, so, and they, and they were demonstrating their their power on a regular basis. Verse 13. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. Now we had just verse, in the previous verse we talked about the apostles. What what is most likely inferred here or being taught here? But none of the rest, none of the other Christians, dared to try to equal the apostles. Uh, their power was just. Uh, extraordinary because it was through the Spirit. Uh, there hasn't been any indications where that where that is being passed down. We will get that in the next chapter, but at this point, it, there's no indication that, that has been passed down specifically. Uh, and and that's what that passage says. Reread that. But none of the rest dare to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. I mean, the apostles at this point were were kind of were kind of. Uh, Elevated in some level above the people, and they were they were they were fearful in some respects. Even though they were doing great wonders, great signs, great miracles, this story of Ananias and Sapphira was something that was uh, that was that was on their mind. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So, 
You know, on the day of Pentecost, we had 3,000. In the last chapter, we had another 2,000 men. <laughs> uh, so the church is likely well in excess of 10,000 at this point. Very large following of Christians at this particular point. Very, very high point for Christianity. And the passage is saying here that the Lord is continuing to add those to the church, uh, those that were being saved. To such an extent that even carried out the sick on the street and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. I don't know that, that scripture there is, is saying that that was the case. Uh, we do certainly remember stories of our Savior as he would walk down the streets and the, and the crowds were pressed in around him. There was a particular case where, where a woman did reach up and grab the Savior's cloak. Uh, and Jesus said he felt the power go out from him into her, and, and then there was a story behind all of that. Uh, so the power certainly was was capable of going out uh, in extraordinary fashions. Uh, most of the miracles we see the apostles form or the, the apostles perform uh, would be with the laying on of hands. But in this particular case, uh, there seems to be somewhat of an inference that. Uh, the, the power that Peter had uh, was, was readily uh, transmitted out to those who were in great need. And then we read verse 16, uh, which is an exceptional story. Listen to this. Also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits. And listen to this. And they were all being healed. So the apostles were busy people at this point. Uh, people were coming in. Uh, people were being healed. The church was being added to. Uh, there was a lot going on with the early church. As with the story of Jesus, the, the experience of these apostles is going to be a bit of a roller coaster. There's some highs and there's some lows. Uh, and they seem to follow each other on a pretty regular basis. We're going now to see some conflict back with the, back with the, uh, the Sadducees uh, and the religious leaders of the day in verse 17. But the high priest, and, and remember, uh, the high priest, according to the law, the high priest was in that position for life, and that would be Annas. Uh, at some point earlier, Annas had gotten into conflict with the Romans, and the Romans had removed him and placed in his position his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So which one of these two individuals, we really don't know. The Jews would probably consider would consider Annas, they're still their high priest, since by, by God's law, he was to serve until his death. Uh, we don't really know which one of these individuals is being talked about here. But the high priest rose up along with his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees. And, and remember, what differentiates the sect the Sadducees from the, from the Pharisees was two or three things. One, they didn't believe in angels. The Sadducees didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in, in demons. And most importantly, they didn't believe in the resurrection. So this story of, of Jesus, which is, which is wrought with the, the power of the resurrection, the power of, of God intervening to raise him from the dead, uh, it just grates of him in, 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 a, in considerable fashion. That is the sect of the Sadducees and they were filled with jealousy. Similar to what happened a couple of chapters earlier. They laid their hands on the apostles and again that, that is basically saying they arrested them. And we really don't know at this point, it doesn't specifically say uh, whether or not it was just Peter and John or if it was all of the apostles. Most commentators believe because of what is going to transpire here in a little bit, it was just Peter and John. Uh, but again, Scripture is rather unclear or vague on that particular matter. We just know it was. It, it could have been just Peter and John, or it could have been all of the apostles. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in jail, in public jail. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said. So it wasn't just this angel coming into the jail and opening it. It's kind of like he came in, the angel came in, opened the gate, and then let them out uh, to, to kind of direct them where he wanted, uh, he wanted them, where the angel wanted them to go. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and take him out, he said. Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. So basically, this angel is, is removing them from prison 
and sending them back to the temple to do what they've been doing. And that's exactly what they do in verse 21. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. So uh, we, just, we just must admire the courage of the apostles. Uh, they, were, they were fearless in their uh, desire to serve God, their desire to serve the Savior, their desire to share this message of which they were witnesses. Uh, just, just an exceptional story. So keep in mind that this all kind of happened to the night. It's early morning now. They've been sent back to the temple and the, these religious leaders are kind of gathering together. They're probably putting together the different members of the, of the, uh, the Sanhedrin, which remember was 72 individuals, three groups of 24, uh, plus uh, the, the high priest, which in this particular case was was two, uh, Annas and Caiaphas. Uh, but very likely they were unable to get all of them, but they would try to get as many of them together as they could to, to hold court. Uh, now, when the high priest and his associates uh, came together, they called the council, came, they called the council together. Now that would be, that would be the Sanhedrin, okay? Potentially as many as 72, 74 individuals. There's also this other group that's referenced that we don't know exactly what it's being referenced. Uh, maybe a little bit more of a public uh, type uh, group. Uh, we, we don't know exactly what it is, but they're kind of called together also. So let's read that whole thing. Now, when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel. So... Uh, the council would be those who take care of the spiritual matters, you know. But there were certainly other public matters that took place that needed some level of of, uh, of, 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 of judgment, you might say. And that was likely what these others. But they've kind of called everyone together to kind of try to combat this problem of Christianity, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. So whether it was the, all the apostles or whether it was just Peter and John, they, they wanted them brought over, not realizing that they're already at the temple uh, preaching and teaching the people. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned back saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened up, we found no one inside. What? You know, you you can just see, and we're they're going to talk here in a little bit more about how perplexed they were. Normally, when someone would break prison, they're not going to go back and try to lock the doors. They're not going to try to. They're just going to try to get away as quickly as they can. Here, the doors haven't. The doors are still locked. The guards are still standing at the door, and uh, it's just it's just a shocking experience for them. Let's pick up now. The captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these things. Now. We talked about this last week. The captain of the temp, the captain of the temple. That man would be second only to the high priest. He was he was in charge of everything that happened at the temple. A very important individual. The chief priests. The Levitical tribe was broken into twenty four different sects. S e c t s. Twenty four different sects. Each one of these six these sects would have. A rotating time when they would serve in the temple, as I understand it, it would be weekly. Each one of those sects, those 24 sects, would then elect a chief priest. So we had, of, of all the Levitical priests, we had each sect had their own chief priest. Those 24 of the chief priests would then be ones that would set on the Sanhedrin. Uh, remember I said there was three groups of 24. So uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and, the, and these chief priests, as I understand it. The, so that, that's who's being referenced here. Let's, let's pick back up in verse 24. Now, when the, when the captain of the temple, temple guard, and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about what about them as to what the that what would come of this but someone came and reported to them the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people so it's like they're expecting these men to have just disappeared just kind of gone into the into the obscurity of, of, of public life again uh, but that's not what happened they went directly back as the angel had instructed them to the temple and began preaching and teaching and healing and doing all the things that they do on a regular basis. They came and reported to them, the, verse 25, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. 
Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. And, and we really don't know. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of, 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 of openness there in interpretation about who they were afraid of. Uh, the church now had, had become very likely in excess of 10,000 people. So to go out and arrest these, these apostles uh, would, would very likely result in an uprising in the church. The people who were bringing, who were bringing their sick to these apostles to be healed would be very frustrated. You know, now we have no way to, for my family members and my loved ones and my friends to receive healing of the, of the ailments which they had. It could have been just about anybody, but clearly the people, they were scared of the people. And this is reminiscent of what happened with the Savior. Uh, the, the Pharisees specifically were, were constantly trying to either trick Jesus or, or catch him in a, in, in a, a lie or, or, or some deceit something where they could trick him and, and get him to where they could where they could execute him or kill him. Uh, they never could. Uh, the, the same thing now has kind of happened to apostles. Uh, the, the people, uh, I guess you would say in some sense, are, are, are protecting them. Uh, and let's reread that verse. And the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence. I mean, they, and, and that would be the, the MO of the, of the apostles. They were not violent people. They were... Uh, willing to come come along with him and go back to the Sanhedrin and and go on his trial again, without violence for they, the Sanhedrin, or the the, the Jewish leaders, the captain of the temple and the chief priests, were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. We're gonna stop right there. Uh, we'll pick up uh, with the with the rest of the story and next week we'll hear. Uh, we'll hear, I guess, Peter's third gospel sermon. Uh, the first sermon happened on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the last sermon that's recorded was happened uh, whenever, uh, whenever he was last uh, in front of the, uh, uh, the Sanhedrin. Uh, and this will be another one that he's going to deliver. Uh, and then we're going to get to hear from uh, a very interesting, a very interesting uh, person by the name of Gamaliel. Uh, Good story and interesting as the as this progresses. So we'll stop there. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen in. Hopefully, it's been a benefit to you in your in your Christian walk and your in your discovery of what God has in His mind for for us as Christians. Let's say a prayer. Father, we're so thankful for the freedom and the ability that we have to study Your Word. We can learn from these, these great men, these fearless men, these apostles, the ch early church about how to behave, about generosity, about courage, about teaching, all the things that, that we still do today. And they did with such, with such fearlessness, and it's just such an inspiration to us, Father. We pray now that you will have blessed this study, bless each of us. May our walk be true, and may we Learn to be more like your son, Jesus. And it is through his name that we pray. Amen.